yeah you go ahead and you start the session please okay okay so topic so will you make the presentation yeah uh, sir we are going live now yeah you upload the slides training is over yeah i will present sir, Uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone. I am Professor Mukund Prohit, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of School of Management Studies at National Forensic Science University. So, uh, before we proceed with our today's webinar, I would like you to introduce the dignitaries which we are, uh, which we are, uh, which, who we are uh, having us in with our webinar. The experts who are present with us do not need an introduction, as they are already established and then they have already established their name in the field of forensic accounting. So present uh, today, we have uh, Srinivasan Rao, sir, who is partner in the firm at Risk Advisory Services at Nanga Anderson firm. Sir has more than 25 years of world experience and has worked in almost all the big firms like KPMG, BWC, BDO, etc. Sir has also worked in the field of forensic and risk management. So apart from uh, Srinivasan Rao, sir, we have Taufik Vahidi, sir, who is a chartered accountant and a certified fraud examiner. So, sir, has more than nine years of experience and has worked on large-scale forensic audited for forensic audits for various banks and financial institutions. And also, he holds certificates in system for audit, forensic auditing, money laundering, and data analysis. Also, so now I would like uh, like to uh, request, uh, sir, to start with your presentation. So, for you, up to you, sir, topic, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mukund, and uh, thank you, Doctor Harish, yes. for giving us an opportunity. It's very exciting. Uh, give a lecture to prospect to forensic specialists because uh, this is one of the area majority of the today generation is not forensic. So when I took over forensic as my um, my career option in way back in 2000, so I never thought that to forensic uh, will become this big and still growing. So, it has uh, a lot of opportunities and potential. And, uh, um, I worked in uh, cross border agriculture in South Asia, uh, Africa, whether it is an uh, Indian subcontinent. There is absolute opportunity. And the world is, uh, in the, um, I mean, um, fantastic opportunity for forensic accounting professionals and forensic professionals. Because of a lot of regulatory environment, a lot of regulatory controls, from that uh, uh, there is absolute reason to pursue somebody's career in forensic due to data uh, changes and uh, digitalization. So forensic accounting, um, forensic, uh, in the words stands itself is a uh, um, very clear respect to uh, its definition. And forensic accounting, uh, I would like to start uh, one proverb from my experience of forensic. Forensic starts where audit and internal audit stops. So this is absolute reason to believe that uh, forensic is something beyond statutory audit and uh, internal audit as well. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I apologize, sir. But sir, if possible, can you please change the view to the full word, uh, the full screen, because it's extended view, sir. If possible. Oh. Yeah, I'll do that. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you. Sir. So um, today we are going to cover uh, a few uh, subjects of forensic accounting. Um, Topic. So can we go to the next slide, please? So, what is forensic accounting that we are going to cover? What angle, which is the most important to, in any forensic incident that happens? And uh, can we go back to the previous slide. Previous, previous, previous. Okay. Your yeah. voice is cracking a little. Yeah. My voice is cracking. Yeah. Okay. So then. Uh, um, I will introduce, then you can take it over because of uh, some network issues today in office. Sure. So, uh, so we will understand and elaborate on what is a fraud profile and uh, some case studies. 
what is the legal perspective because uh, after doing everything uh, every investigation every covering every aspect of the investigation we need to attain some goal and some purpose so that will be achieved from a legal perspective also some case that so we will discuss so with respect to so topic of please take over from here yes. i will re i will reconnect absolutely <clears throat> so um good afternoon to everyone and uh, thank you for having us here thank you uh, mr purohit and uh, srini sir for the very good introduction so uh, let me just dive into the concepts of uh, basic forensic audits and as srini said we'll later on discuss some real life case studies all the cases that we are going to discuss today are actual cases that have happened internationally or we have solved ourselves so all very very contemporary knowledge today so what is forensic accounting now we know what accountancy is like our presentation of books and writing and record keeping and all that so where does the forensic part come into accounting that is what we do so forensic accounting involves using the same accounting concepts to investigate a fraud and to analyze the financial information now when we say uh, investigate a fraud and analyze information this sounds pretty um, pretty generic right all accountants do that you have chartered accountants who do that people who work in due diligence do that but our idea the whole concept of making it forensic is that it has to be so airtight that it can be presented as evidence in court of law so uh, the idea would be to have a very in depth analysis of uh, transactions to find out the root of uh, to find out the root of the transaction the main purpose why the transaction was conducted as evidenced from further uh, further information from as evidence from all the surrounding information so often as forensic uh, auditors as forensic accountants we do not just rely on what we see the entries the debits and the credits we go <clears throat> we Uh, go beyond the veil. We turn, uh, we turn uh, to look at who the people involved uh, in the whole transaction were, and then formulate an opinion. So, uh, forensic accounting is a mix of a lot of uh, investigative and analytical procedures, and not just bookkeeping, and not just rec maintaining records. <clears throat> so just to add now i'm i may be audible just to yeah. add what topic just mentioned so it is a culmination of understanding the process evolving the data understanding the data linking the data and arriving at a, a proper gap analysis so with a lot of evidence that is required to culminate the engagement so uh, i mean every organization will have a lot of data but uh, unfortunately they don't dive into the data facts so if you harass the data data will start speaking data analysis is very critical for forensic accounting trust me whether you have auditing skills or internal audit skills but uh, the way you ask the questions and questions during as your forensic investigation that itself shows the vulnerability and the perpetrators as well okay yeah so i'll continue so uh, so uh, what are the various types of forensic accounting so basically forensic accounting uh, and as accountants you would be asked to uh, assist in two major things one would be an investigative support or a litigation support now investigative support we talk about internal investigations about people who have worked uh, who usually work in corporate so whether it be that uh looking whether an employee has taken a bribe whether there has been a kickback scheme involved or some sort of in, internal in, internal or external investigation where you might be asked to have a look at the books of some other person a third party you're contracting with or a partner you uh, you're trying to get into a person you're trying to get into a new partnership you want to do a background check you want to see uh, the books of that firm so that's investigative support then uh, uh, the other major aspect of forensic accounting is litigation support and litigation support actually has no uh, no end or no uh, prefix definition to it 
so litigation support is any sort of uh, work which we do to support a uh, current or a prospective litigation so uh, giving you a live example here let's say a, uh, a bank has given out a loan and the loan has gone bad now the bank wants to investigate they want to have a forensic audit done to see whether uh, there has been any sort of miss uh, doing or malpractice uh, as far as this loan was concerned so they might uh, they will uh, ask a forensic auditor much like yourself to investigate and support them in this in this litigation so this will involve collecting evidence about uh, any fraud that has happened collecting evidence about any misutilization of loan or any deliberate breach of contract these are these are the two main buckets of what forensic accountants do and as you know it's it's a broad term to say that yeah we deal with fraud we work with fraud but what exactly do we do about fraud forensic accountants as uh, would help in uh, in the prevention of fraud detection and then a response to fraud so prevention of fraud uh, comes when you are doing a, let's say a sort of a risk analysis of fraud risk assessment where somebody has asked you or you want to strengthen the um, the internal controls of your organization and you want to see what are the pitfalls which can be misutilized for fraud uh, detection of a fraud which has already occurred uh, you already know or you suspect there has been a fraud in the organization and we need to uh, we need to assess whether our our assessment of fraud uh, of uh, suspicion of fraud is grounded in reality and uh, what can be done about this event to prevent such occurrences in future so these are the three three main kind of work that we do as forensic accountants so just to add uh, one more thing in the interest of the students when you whenever you start a forensic investigation so to make sure that you have answers for IUW1H. So that is a critical aspect for any successful investigation. So IWH, when, what, where, why, okay. IW1H. You have interactive sessions with the operators, interactive sessions with the stakeholders, so the relevant teams and relevant people. I must say that you will get, you will easily solve the problem. In some cases, it depends on the complexity. But once you answer these five questions, the report will be sufficient enough to address the client concerns or your organizational concerns. Pick please. So uh, right now, uh, there is a lot of activity, a lot of buzz around the forensic accounting uh, as a profession, as uh, as a domain of hiring and, and work. So what are, uh, why that has happened and as students probably, it's, um, it's quite interesting for you guys to know as students of criminology, why forensic accountants are so much, uh, so much in demand these days. One is increasing financial statement fraud schemes, a lot of uh, you, uh, th I mean, this is, uh, if you ever switch on a business channel, this is one thing you would often hear about somebody suspected of fraud, somebody being investigated of fraud. And in all, all metros, all important cities, you'll find someone or the other being uh, harassed or arrested for fraud. The massive financial accounting scandals. Uh, Wirecard was one in the recent years that happened in Germany. I'm talking about Satyam. And and uh, DHFL, so many so many to name from the uh, from just a few previous years. A uh, need for fair business valuations. Uh, so as forensic accountants, you know when you uh, present uh, your findings about fraud, when you present your findings about um, uh, about uh, uh, any wrongdoing or malpractice uh, or any accounting uh, irregularity in uh, in any corporate or company it impacts the valuation of that company uh, the investors the lenders want to take a second review of uh, of the money that has gone into that company and uh, hence forensic accounting support for investigation for sorry for investments is one of the key factors that private equities and venture capitals now look at 
avoidance of claims and litigations th this one should be fairly obvious um, so in case a company has been involved in fraud sooner or later it's going to come to light there they might be a claim there might be some sort of litigation which as forensic accountants with our with uh, hiring a forensic accountant for pre due diligence this might be avoidable reducing the risk of exploitation uh, to the organization again uh, fairly uh, fairly self explanatory as we discussed uh, one of the things we do is uh, in a fraud risk assessment is to uh, look at internal controls which can be exploited for fraud and uh, hence we can reduce the risk of uh, of uh, frauds being conducted in uh, internally in the organization for minimizing financial and reputational loss reputation loss is a very interesting aspect of uh, of forensics because um, whenever there is a fraud whether or not it's ever proved if you ever have a claim of fraud against a, against a corporate the first thing that happens is uh, the stock prices go down and that's all because of reputation that's mainly attributed Professor Mukund, am I audible? Yes, sir, sir. you are audible, sir. Ha, Taufik, uh, sir, is not. Uh, yeah, maybe some fun. technology is closed. Yeah. yeah. He... Taufik, uh, you can start from the reputational loss. So there was some network issue from your side. Apologies to everyone. Okay. Not an issue, sir. Please, sir. Where should I start from? So the reputational damages. So okay, the reputational damage. About. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, what I was uh, mentioning is that uh, whenever there is a claim or a suspicion that some fraud has occurred in some company, you might often see if it's a listed entity, the st stock prices fluctuate a lot. And that's mainly because uh, in the investor's mind, the company immediately moves from white to a gray area. So some some sort of cloud comes over that, and reputational loss impacts a lot. Uh, the how the investors perceive the company, how they uh, perceive the corporate governance and the board of that uh, uh, that entity. So if you have a good internal control system, if you have uh, I would say a regular investigative approach to the towards uh, to uh, to governing risks, then the chances of uh, of suffering a reputational loss because of fraud becomes um, minimal it cannot be eradicated but becomes very less so uh, moving on to uh, some of the recent examples of what we have heard about in the media of what has come to light uh, is uh, a lot of fraud cases are reported from across the world uh, banks have been especially in the firing line a lot uh, having faced a massive penalties uh, banks have also in india in the indian context especially suffered a lot of damage uh, or and loss of capital because of uh, recurring npas and because of recurring bad loans so uh, let's have a look at some very interesting statistics i mean these are self explanatory but i'll just quickly run through uh, some of them is that uh, uh, every year every two years uh, acfe releases a report and these are from the latest report which was released in 2020 so uh, what ha what they found is that globally organizations lose 5% of revenue to fraud and if you uh, look at uh, the revenues of some of the largest organizations you'll know that this figure could run, very well run in trillions of dollars so a uh, median loss per case is one lakh twenty five thousand dollars, and uh, for Asia Pacific, uh, especially the loss is even higher, one lakh ninety five thousand. Globally, um, uh, corruption schemes were the most uh, most common schemes of uh, fraud, and uh, typically a fraud scheme runs for around fourteen months before it's uh, uh, before it's uh, discovered. And causes a loss of around eight lakh eight thousand three hundred dollars per month. 
so the reason for a high median loss for asia pacific region is only because of our regulatory environment is still uh, uh, um, uh, not the best industry practices yeah. however uh, and another point which is uh, uh, in india is uh, let it happen and we know that we have the robust controls unless until we see a doctor we don't know whether we have a, uh, we are diabetic or we are in hypertension so um forensic so you guys will be the forensic specialist in future unless until somebody makes an attempt to understand and to do the diagnostic review it will not be easily mitigated the fraud steps are always evolving and the perpetrators are uh, always become innovative Uh, can I move on? Yeah, please. please. Yeah. So uh, let's have a look at uh, some of the some of the what I call the theoretical uh, basis of understanding fraud. Now these are very important, especially when you're working in an organization who uh, which is trying to uh, rejig its internal control systems. Uh, having an understanding of why people commit fraud or why frauds are committed and uh, can help us understand why frauds can be, how frauds can be stopped so uh, the fraud triangle was first proposed by cressy uh, sorry, uh criminal psychologist and um, he proposed that there are three aspects to to a situation where a person can uh, commit fraud one is having a perceived financial need that is a person realizes you you need money you and you, and you have a persistent requirement which can be uh, sorted out in secrecy it's it cannot be shared with others and ha and has to be of a very pressing nature now the important thing here to understand is that the need may actually not be there it's a perception the person thinks he needs the money he thinks he uh, presumes that there is a uh, um, a require a financial trouble that he is currently into and which cannot be shared with others and can be resolved in secrecy then is a perceived opportunity a perceived opportunity is a situation of which his employment or his work gives him the opportunity to exploit so that he can solve his uh, pressing financial need this uh, can be an into a weak internal control a very casual environment in the organization where everyone does some sort of you know malpractice or the other the rules not being followed the rules not being there at all indeed and then comes the rationalization so a person has had a uh, he person thinks he needs money he has exploited the system to gain the money and what about rationalization then rationalization is how that person tells himself that he is still an honest person and that he is not a thief the uh, the interesting part about uh, occupational frauds is that most of the people and uh, i think we'll come across some statistics in uh, later slides for that uh, the interesting thing is that most of the people who do commit such frauds do not have a criminal history they are not career criminals and hence they have this perspective uh, this uh, perspective of themselves that they are very honest people in fact other people also think of themselves as very honest hard working people and hence it is very important for them to justify that image to themselves and once they have committed a fraud they go back to rationalizing it giving a justification to themselves the rationalization has the, is a, it need not be external a, a justification need not be given to someone else justification needs to be given to yourself that i committed this fraud this is not a fraud i just took the money i'm going to pay it back the organization owes it to me i'm not paid enough i worked so hard that they owe it to me and all that that falls under your rationalization how you think well of yourself even after having committed the fraud so what are the most common fraud schemes we briefly came across some fraud schemes but there are three main fraud schemes here uh, all all the sorts of frauds can be can, uh, can be accumulated into these three uh, schemes corruption asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud now corruption all of us understand corruption in one way or the other 
and it's extremely prevalent even in organizations in private organization it's not just a government organization thing one of uh, so corruption is not just bribery of course that is a form of corruption but there can be other other uh, forms too so for example conflict of interest putting yourself in a position where you have to choose between two uh, options which makes your decision difficult is a conflict of interest say for example a manager or a director of a company who has to uh, give a contract whether he should give a contract to his own uh, company his other company or uh, to a genuine third party that's a very very primary example of a conflict of interest where he has put himself in uh, a situation where he has to choose between his own personal interests and the interest of uh, the organization briberies we know what bribery is just giving uh, it's illegal giving money of uh, 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 the giving of money for exercising influence of uh, over someone or for getting uh, your way around the rules or the regulations bribery is mainly uh, can broadly classified into a kickback which is uh, yeah, bribery can be direct as well of course like you just give money to someone And then kickback is also a form of bribery where um, you receive a commission like if you if a gov if somebody gives you the contract you pay him some money uh, out of your own earning so he has received a kickback bribery schemes are very difficult to detect because uh, often uh, bribery schemes are convoluted and they do not involve a cash or a bank component not necessarily uh, bribery bribes can be paid in kind as well so you'll often hear about people um, in in return of favors giving uh, tickets foreign tours scholarships and things like that illegal gratuities illegal gratuities is again giving of um, giving of a reward for doing something uh, why is it illegal is because uh, it's it's a method of exercising influence over someone so for example someone says that uh, you know if you give me this tender or if you uh, you know, give me so many marks or so many points i'm going to give you a reward so that's an illegal gratuity at its base and then economic extortion is demanding money demanding bribes you'll often come across uh, economic extortion in um, uh, in very corrupt government offices and also in sometimes in you know private organizations where somebody in return for service will uh, will not pass your file will not do something and you know, unless you pay them something over and above then asset misappropriation uh, asset misappropriation is basically just taking assets of the organization and using them for your own purpose uh, so cash embezzlement is the most common form of uh, most is the, it pro probably the easiest form of asset misappropriation you get uh, you get uh, money for the organization whether that's a sale or a debt being recovered and you don't actually pass it on to the organization you just pocket it a uh, fraudulent disbursement again a very employee uh, so very employee centric uh, fraud uh, where employees overcharge for uh, out of pocket expenses or employees overcharge for reimbursements uh and hence you know create a situation where uh, they get extra money or some or, or just a um, uh, from the cash or the accounting uh, department giving off uh, creating fake vouchers and uh, fake invoices to pocket more and more money from the organization misuse and larceny of inventories and other assets so um, larceny is basically common theft so uh, an inventory and other and some other assets you know office supplies uh, stationery these things can be very easily stolen from the organization and that is also a fraud scheme financial statement frauds very high level of uh, frauds uh, mostly organizations uh, mostly uh, people who do financial statement frauds are you know uh, cfo level people who uh, uh, who have that sort of control over the financials which are reported to the organ uh, reported to external parties so financial statement frauds would be uh, over um, uh, overestimating your assets or underestimating your liabilities showing a better picture of the organization higher profits uh, 
uh, or le lower expenses, higher revenues when they don't exist. Financial statement frauds are extremely common and most frauds that you hear about, be that Satyam, be that Enron, or even in the contemporary times, you'll find financial statement frauds uh, coming over and over again. Uh, high risk fraud areas in uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, is someone saying anything? So let me take over uh, and breathe. Yeah. Sure. You can take a deep breath. Sure, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, 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 last one and a half year, we are passing very sensitive time. And uh, basically, uh, the vulnerabilities and perpetrators have become more um, opportunistic to exploit to the existing controls. So, the current scenario, we classified uh, high risk areas and high risk areas where the perpetrators are focusing in the uh, uh, is uh, digital assets the laptop misappropriation data misappropriation data theft and mobile assets all these categories so it can be done by internal perpetrators or external vulnerability as well mobile assets so some opportunity to authorize the use of mobile less inventory is appropriation because a lot of these procurements happen under the code special circumstances controls so people try to exploit these type of uh, type of uh, yeah, Mukunji, you raise the sorry, sir, sorry to interrupt sir but sir uh, students are messaging that your voice is getting interrupted sir i think Taufik, you only take care <laughs> Sure, sir. Sure, sir. My sincere apologies, sir. So uh, let me carry on from where uh, strings are left off. Um, so what we are discussing is high risk, uh, some ex extra risks that have now come into the picture because of COVID-19. And you'll find many of these risks exist mainly because we are working uh, from uh, remote locations. So. Uh, Asset misappropriation has become sort of an easier thing because you have your office laptops, you're not going to office anymore, you're working from home, you have office data, office information, you have all the supplies from the office, but uh, everything is under your control. So the control centers have actually now become the employees themselves. And hence, you'll find a lot of uh, new, new sort of frauds that happen because of uh, this COVID-induced new work environment. So uh, be that in CSR supplies. Now, CSR, uh, a lot of companies have given off, uh, have increased their CSR spending in the name of COVID-19, and not all of that is genuine. So payment to fictitious entities for allegedly for you know, getting more vaccines, for uh, vaccine camps, or just donations to various organizations uh, is, you know, is, is a high risk area now. A hygiene sim, uh, supply, uh, we're talking about uh, a mass, mass production of supply of, um, uh, of sanitizers, a mass production of masks and other sort of things which have become very uh, common due to COVID-19 pandemic. Then uh, fictitious payments, or, uh, unauthorized alterations um, made in databases to, to pay out Again, uh, again, a risk factor which has now increased because of uh, our remote working, of being away from servers, of less direct supervision, uh, expense frauds. A lot of um, a lot of companies have increased their spending on employees because to accommodate for uh, you know work from home environments, uh, and hence uh, forging and fake expenses is sort of easier because because what's the check like who can go and check to an employee who lives so far away from the main center inventory uh, uh in inventory less supervision because of uh, less manning of warehouses is is a very common thing these days movable assets as we discussed uh, of a lot of uh, things which people have just carried with themselves uh, create, it creates an opportunity where you can abuse and miss your, uh, or gain unauthorized access to office um, to uh, office uh, uh, assets.
yeah and so uh, again a reinforcement of what we just saw here yeah, uh, whopping 86% of all the occupational fraud is because of asset misappropriation and due to COVID, the lack of uh, the lack of uh, supervision and the lack of uh, direct office control has resulted in an environment which which is more susceptible to fraud risks. Occupational fraud schemes. <clears throat> So what's an occupational fraud, basically? Uh, broadly, it is any fraud that you can do in uh, in uh, um, in connection with your occupation. So it it would include a fraud uh, done by businessmen, politicians, labor unions, lawyers, doctors, pharmacists, employees, anyone who works in any sort of organization has any sort of occupation can do some sort of fraud whether to his own detriment or the detriment detriment of others so uh, uh, occupational fraud basically can be categorized into four four uh, buckets one is an organizational occupational crime which uh, which is a fraud you do or a crime you do for the benefit of your organization here, uh, one interesting aspect is who are the employees who would do that? Who would put your uh, put himself at risk to uh, cover for his employer or his organization? So you'll find, uh, and uh, the ACFE, uh, the ACFE survey uh, actually reinforces this: that most and largest running scheme, the most um, devastating uh, schemes, are run by the owners of businesses or high level managers so people who have been in the organization for a very long time people who have been very loyal to the organization are more prone to conduct, to commit frauds for the benefit of the organization professional occupational crime uh, uh, frauds committed by uh, professionals in their capacity as professionals so uh, be that doctors giving out fake prescriptions doctors giving out excessive prescriptions or some so accountants uh, writing, uh, preparing fake balance sheets and things like that. Uh, uh, occupational crime as individuals, individ uh, crimes committed by individuals uh, against their employer, against their organization. Uh, this, this would cover your asset misappropriation schemes and things like that. Uh, governmental authority occupational crime, crimes committed by officials through exercise of their government-based authority so uh bribes kickbacks which run in government offices would be covered over here so now uh whether individuals should be held responsible now this is a question which i would like to ask the audience whether individuals should should be held responsible for crimes committed on behalf of their organization so let's say there's a manager who has committed some sort of fraud or who has misrepresented to the bank because his organization needs needed the money would should that person be charged for fraud that's a question to the audience so if anyone from the audience wants to take it up yes mukun uh yes rohin you can uh yes rohin you can go ahead with the answer you can switch on your camera and go ahead yes Jinma, you also uh, hello sir uh, yeah so so i believe that the answer would be yes uh, because mainly the manager or any other person in the company should be held responsible because it is it is a form of vicarious or imputed form of liability if it does the organization would also be affected by the same so i guess the answer would be yes point well taken we have some people who support the vicarious liability in the audience well that's good yes so uh, mostly you'll find um, there is some sort of uh, uh, some sort of uh, consensus built around that uh, that aspect and uh, people who are directly in control are considered to be uh, uh, responsible 
for the acts which they do for the organization would be that you know uh, even if even if they uh, have not earned something themselves which is rare actually you know nobody does a fraud just for the heck of it so uh, there has been more research on occupational fraud and abuse one important uh, comes from sir edwin uh, h sutherland uh, uh, who described the theories of criminal activity and uh, what he said is that criminality cannot occur without assistance of other people so there has to be more than one person involved in the crime especially in an occupational setting someone or the other has to set a base before one person does you know uh, commits a fraud and criminal activity usually occurs within intimate personal groups so uh, more than one person but never or very less frequently very detached people it's always a cohort of small band of people who would be involved and this is uh, if you look at um, the more common fraud schemes like uh, financial statement fraud or asset uh, maybe not asset misappropriation per se but uh, definitely financial statement fraud or corruption schemes you'll find that there are more uh, more than one person it's never just one person doing it uh, running the show a uh, research in occupational fraud and abuse now i i i like all of you to read this uh, this definition uh, of a trusted person becoming a trusted violator when he thinks or conceives uh, of uh, himself having a financial problem a problem which is non shareable and uh, hence he cannot ma make other people aware of this and and more importantly he is aware that this problem can be solved in secret by the violation of uh, a situation or violation of a uh, trust which his organization has placed on him so basically you to misutilizing uh, internal control weakness he can solve this financial trouble and then uh, uses a uh, verbalization to enable himself to adjust the conception of himself as a trusted person and uh, and not get into uh, you know the understanding of himself as a trusted violator this is the foundation of what we um, what we read as the fraud triangle so uh, that was my question to uh, to be asked here actually the concept in cressy's hypothesis resembles is the basis of what we uh, today know as the fraud triangle uh one more uh, interesting uh interesting uh, research on occupational fraud and abuse is the fraud scale so uh, the fraud scale uh, presumes that you have some uh, level of integrity uh, and uh, that helps in understanding each person's motives so when you have a high situational pressure and you have very high opportunities to commit a fraud you will not commit the fraud unless the person is also uh inflicted with very low personal integrity so people with high integrity do not commit frauds even if the situational pressures are high even with uh, uh even if the opportunities to commit fraud are high you need a person who has some some sort of you know uh, issue with his integrity that was albrecht's idea that integrity of a person so it's a very person to person thing uh, to commit a fraud i'll take a little sip of water before we go on to the uh, fraud profiles and some case studies so uh, repeatedly people have analyzed what a fraudster looks like or are there any sort of connections or any sort of uh, correlations between um, correlations between various uh, people who commit frauds and you'll find that there are certain uh, propensities which uh, can be very clearly defined so for example um, most in most cases and this is all from the acfe survey so there is some some sort of a uh, so surveyor bias in this but uh, mostly it's the fraud uh, frauds which have been examined are committed by males so 72% of frauds are committed by men and 28% of the reported frauds have been conducted by women so uh so it's kind of hard to say that women um, 
are just more honest than men uh, naturally but definitely the numbers kind of give that uh, give that impression there was also a study conducted by uh, um, by a business school in london i think it was the cas business school and they uh, had a look into the various boards of banks and found that both members uh, or uh, the boards uh, which have board of directors who uh, have more women than men or where the proportion of women is higher commit uh, are prone to lesser frauds than men so that is also a study which somewhat correlates what the acfe found um another interesting uh, thing is uh, the education of fraudsters i'll uh, we'll come to this later on as well um uh the, most of the fraudsters who found had uh, were were educated so they had at least a graduate uh, college degree uh and were not completely illiterate uh people they had certain uh, age in the organization and were mostly not newbies so um older fraudsters uh, uh, cause much uh, larger median losses which kind of reinforces the fact that more you have been in the organization the more you are in a position to access or uh, misuse the uh, internal controls more vastly now when we look at frauds and uh, in our own investigations we often go forth and make a, a profile of the fraudster so uh, when we when you have a suspect or you have a person you of a person of interest you are investigating you uh, what we do is we make two uh, sorts of profiles a financial profile and a behavioral profile a financial profile would include information about that person a uh, person's assets incomes expenses liabilities and what what sort of you know how rich trying to assess how rich that person is how much is his net worth uh, so trying to see the pressure part the uh, the financial pressure part of the fraud triangle the second thing which we do is this the key behavioral red flags because everywhere every in every fraud with every fraudster you find that there are certain uh, behavioral things that they indulge in the most common is living beyond means so if a person has been committing a fraud if a person has been you know uh, repeatedly violating his position of trust in the organization he would start uh, um, to, he will first of all he obviously he start to get more money and with that money he'll start living beyond his means so he uh, probably go on vacations he'll probably have a better car than is uh and and that that will be suspicious so you you'll often come across uh you know cases where a person um uh, uh who recently bought a car or bought a very expensive car was later uh, later on found to be involved in some sort of fraud financial difficulties again something that comes from the financial profile close association with vendor and suppliers and uh, vendors and customers so uh, this is a very uh, common sort of, of fraud and you'll find that in 19% of the cases there is uh, the fraudster has you know a close connection with his uh, with the vendors or suppliers and and that uh, gives you a hint if there has been some sort of vendor collusion we'll come to the netflix case and we'll discuss this a little more so uh, perpetrators level and authority and occupational fraud so uh, even though employees that's low level uh, people would commit more frauds but the impact of frauds is very less so uh, owners and executives that is uh, you know the cfo cxo level people they might commit less frauds like 20% but the uh, median losses are way higher it's 600 6 lakh dollars uh gender distribution we again discussed uh, all the black lines are male so the males uh, male fraudsters are more common than female fraudsters and uh, education level so as we discussed high, uh, every fraud most fraudsters have some sort of uh, some sort of education so high school graduate or less would be 22% but university degrees 49% and the median losses are also 
higher. And if you are postgraduates, that means you are ideally saying smart people, much like yourselves. So you guys can come at better frauds. So let's let's take a case study and uh, see the Netflix case. Okay, now I uh, hope and I'm sure actually all of you must have heard about Netflix. It's the online uh, movie streaming <clears throat> service. So Netflix recently uh, had a very um, very high profile case where the chief technology officer of Netflix was arrested and convicted of 19 counts of wire fraud, that is embezzlement of money, three counts of mail fraud and seven counts of money laundering. So massive, massive frauds here. So uh, the idea is, uh, can someone give me a time check if I'm running on time? Should I have speed up? Mr. Purohit, are we oh, on time? Yes, sir, we are on time, sir. Okay, yes, so I'll go in a little detail about the Netflix case study, but I'll try to rush through the rest. So uh, this one's just more more interesting. So uh, 